Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today, the MTA is taking another step uh, on our, to make our system more compatible with a range of micro-mobility options. And we're starting with bike access. Starting today, we have our first Unipod for bike parking at Grand Central Terminal. It's located in the former taxiway space in the, the Vanderbilt entrance area on 43rd and Vanderbilt behind me. The Unipod is safe and convenient and it's amenity for cyclists. It gives them a secure place to store their bikes when they come to Grand Central uh, to make a connection and it's easily accessible to the West Balcony and all of this amazing uh, transportation facility. Obviously, six parking spaces is not a game changer right off the bat. We have no illusions about that, but it's a start, and I'm thankful to Shabazz Stewart, the co-founder of Uni and a friend and neighbor of mine in Brooklyn, for being a great partner in this program. He'll be giving us a demo on how it all works in a moment. This is the time to, to talk seriously and think seriously about micro mobility, that last mile connection that makes it possible for so many people to take full advantage of our mass transit system. Cycling is a key link. It exploded in popularity during the pandemic, both for recreation and for commuting. And cycling's great for what, as I say, we call the last mile connection in transportation planning. That's that last leg that gets you to and from home between home and mass transit. Anything that makes it easier for our customers is good, especially as we work to increase ridership, and ridership is coming back. Just this week, we hit three million. Literally two days ago, we hit three million for the first time since the Omicron surge happened. Then yesterday, we had another record, and today, I'm gonna to get a little ahead of myself, it feels like, on the, on the trains that there's another record in the making. We expect more customers to be coming back in the next few weeks. Obviously, all kinds of things are happening as the Omicron surge has dissipated. Um, and the revel of, it's not just weekday travel, which we all track most closely, but the sign that New Yorkers are ready to, to use mass transit, the most important sign is the fact that discretionary travel, nights, weekends, is at well over 70% of pre-COVID levels. That is a great sign. And I got some important news this week when uh, the New York City Partnership leadership told me that they believe that major employers are going to significantly increase their level <coughs> of office employment in the next month or six weeks. <coughs> the MTA is ready for our workforce to come back to work. In a couple of weeks, our new fare promotions begin. That's fare capping for the first time on subways and on the railroads. A new 20 trip uh, discounted ticket for the commuter railroads that's perfect and designed for the new hybrid worker. Plus discounts on monthly tickets on the commuter railroads and the expansion of the flat fare city ticket for all off-peak travel between commuter railroad stations within the city. The UniPilot is a great complement to all of these initiatives. You'll be hearing more on bike access throughout the year. This is something, it's not a secret, that we are prioritizing as we bring New York back uh, after the pandemic. Now, the legislature has mandated us to do a better job and to come up with a lot of new initiatives and in thinking on bike access, and we hear them. We're working on a comprehensive plan that will include not only traditional bikes, my preference, but also e-bikes, e-scooters, and much more. So stay tuned. So let me turn it over now to my friend Kathy Rinaldi, now only the president of Metro North Railroad, but pretty soon even more. Kathy. Jenna, thank you. It's always a great thing for us to be able to partner with homegrown companies like Uni on initiatives that add value for our customers and for the region at large. Because what Jana said about connecting our customers to our stations is exactly right. 
riders need better access to train stations so that public transportation is the most convenient and sustainable travel option. If they want to ride their bikes to the station, they should be able to. Last summer, both railroads cut a lot of the red tape surrounding cycling and transit, eliminating the paper, uh, the paper permit requirement to bring a bike on board. But our ongoing efforts go beyond just eliminating bike permits and expanding bike parking. We're also pushing for transit-oriented development wherever possible so that people who live near stations can just walk over. We've partnered with Zipcar to make short-term car rentals dovetail with convenient gateways. Metro North runs our own Hudson Rail Link uh, buses at Riverdale and Spite and Dival stations in the Bronx. And we work with regional bus providers like the Westchester Beeline bus to be able to create seamless connections to services throughout the region. Ferries are an option for our Rockland County and Orange County customers who want to take uh, Metro North service east of the Hudson River. There is a whole world of possibility out there, and I'm thrilled to be here today to be able to solidify our support for micromobility and to make daily riding a little bit easier for the growing number of cyclists in our region. I'd really like to thank Metro North Station's department, who's been working very, very hard on this initiative for over a year now, uh, and to make this pilot happen. And I'd also like to thank our board member, Norman Brown, who was the person who brought this idea to me uh, probably over a year and a half ago now, and who brought Shabazz into the fold uh, because he was aware of the great work that Shabazz was doing. And I'd like to invite Shabazz up to the to mic to be able to explain a little bit about the pilot. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Shabazz Stewart. I'm the founder, uh, co-founder more accurately, and CEO of Uni. Um, and the story of our company, the story of our effort, is a group of folks, a group of advocates, New Yorkers, um, who want to see their city, their community, their home become friendlier to green, sustainable, egalitarian, equitable modes of transportation. Um, before I get into the pilot and how it works, um, I want to say thank you to a few people. Um, foremost, I want to thank MTA leadership. Oh, excuse me, wrong side. MTA leadership. Um, you know, as as Kathy mentioned, it was the MTA that initiated this conversation about transforming Grand Central into a commuter hub that was truly intermodal um, and. Throughout the course of our working relationship, um, it's just been a joy. You know, usually um, startups tend to have a degree of apprehension um, in working with government. I can say that our experience has been nothing short of delightful, um, and we're hopeful and optimistic that we can have the opportunity um, to work with the nation's largest uh, transit agency, mass transit agency, um, in the future to expand this program. Um, I'd like to thank Transportation Alternatives and Danny Harris um, for their tireless advocacy, friendship, and leadership uh, on this critical issue and so many others. Um, and I'd like to thank our team. You know, we've got uh, Kat, we've got Yosef, uh, we've got Leon around here. If you see them, say hi, because these folks, man-man in the back, are just tireless advocates for this work and really are, are what makes this possible. So um, I grew up in Brooklyn. And I, as a child, wanted to be a transit, I wanted to be a train conductor. Um, and then as I got older, I wanted to build transit, not just for myself, but for my city, for my community. Um, I don't ever think in my wildest dreams I ever imagined that I would be standing here with all of you today um, in such a historic location. Um, it's only fitting that we are going to make history together in a location in itself that is so historic. What we're doing today, yes, it is just six spaces, but it represents the first time in our region's history that we have put an intermodal cycle hub at a major transit facility, the first time ever. And frankly, it's going to be the first of many. So how does it work? Uni, which is located upstairs along Vanderbilt, is going to be free to use. It's going to operate on a first come, first serve basis. And eventually, it's going to be tied into a citywide network of free to use, first come, first serve cycle parking hubs. Now, why is it first come, first serve? Why is it free to use? 
Here in New York City, we're recovering from you know, the deepest recession since the Great Depression. We're recovering from a grave pandemic. Uh, and New Yorkers can't afford to pay a subscription fee for another mobility service. So we fought hard to implement a business model that would make, some, that would make the service truly free. Now, this isn't just about secure bike parking. It's about making transit work for everyone, work for every single New Yorker. It's about improving the passenger experience, improving first mile, last mile connectivity. It's about taking this historic location and allowing it to reach so many more people. And so I'm convinced that this is the beginning of something historic and special. And I can think of no better place to mark that moment. And I am so thankful for all of us for the opportunity to work with you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just introduce Danny Harris. Danny is the executive director of Transportation Alternatives, which is, you know, the original bike pedestrian advocacy organization. I, I, I say as an old New Yorker who's been in the transportation racket for a long time, no organization has done more to change how we think about bicycle and transportation than TA, and Danny's the head of it. Danny? Thank you very much. I'm, my name is Danny Harris. I'm honored to be the executive director of Transportation Alternatives. Um, John Oak, Kathy, uh, and to everybody at MTA, I just want to give a huge amount of, of gratitude and appreciation to the work that you're doing every day. There is no New York City without public transit. This truly is the lifeblood of our city and just a huge amount of gratitude for what you and your team are doing every day, especially under such difficult circumstances. And to Shabazz, I want to congratulate you I met you early on in my tenure as you were talking about this big transformational idea that you were working on and I, I couldn't imagine a better person to be doing it. Um, to be a transportation advocate or to work in the space, you deal with a lot of traffic and getting things done and you have certainly made your way through it. So thank you and I look forward to standing with you for more and more groundbreakings. I'm not here to talk about bikes or bike parking. I'm here to talk about opportunity. Commute time is one of the single biggest indicators of moving people out of generational poverty. One in four New Yorkers have had their bikes stolen. For every one car that's registered in New York City, there's 1.5 parking spaces available to you. I know it may not always seem that way, but for every one person who bikes, there's only 100, there's 116, uh, so there's 116 spaces waiting for you. Sorry, the opposite, for every one bike, uh, for every 116 bikes, there's one bike waiting for you. I've obviously rehearsed that one many times. But what I want to talk about today is this is an opportunity to give New York back to New Yorkers. The second biggest reason that people don't bike is because of the absence of secure bike parking. Today we advanced six secure bike, sp par bike parking spaces in this monumental location. Soon we'll have more until every New Yorker can be able to ride their bike both safely on their streets, but also to have a safe place to put it. I'm so grateful to be here on behalf of Transportation Alternatives. May we continue to stand together from groundbreaking to groundbreaking to get more New Yorkers on bikes and get the city back to moving. Thank you so much. On topic, on topic. Can someone explain what exactly this program is going to be about? Hi. Sorry, what's the question? What is this program going to be about? Uh, it's about, you know, I think Danny put it most eloquently. Um, it's about expanding access to transportation to folks who currently don't have it. So, you know, the, basically, transit, transit stations have what we call a catchment area. And what that means is, you know, there's only so many blocks that people are willing to walk um, to get to a transit facility. And the reason why so many cities across the globe have invested in what we call intermodal facilities um, is because when you have someone on a bike or a city bike or whatever, um, it basically allows them to go so much more further. So instead of going two blocks, they can go seven blocks, eight blocks. And the, the catchment area study show is enlarged by about three or four times 
when you put a bike facility um, in, the, in the actual transit, in the, in the transit hub. So this is about allowing New Yorkers um, to travel further um, from transit to get to their destination or to live further from transit um, at the first end of their, des of their, of their trip. Is it on? Yeah. Hi, Jano. Uh, in, when this was passed or when this program was authorized at the board meeting last year, you had pointed out, Jano, that six spaces isn't enough. So what's your overall plan to add more bike parking uh, to the MTA service area? Would, do you have a plan? Do you have specifics? Do you have a, have a vision for this? I think, you know, every, every you know, not to, to, to be in the cliche business, but every journey begins with a single step. This is a very important first step, not because of the number of bike parking spaces, but because what we're saying is we're willing to take historic facilities that are the center of the transportation universe of New York and make, equip them with bike parking, period, full stop. So we're going to be looking at, oppor at opportunities all around now. The issue is it gets more complicated where the MTA doesn't control the real estate around our facilities. But where we do control the real estate, and that starts with uh, obviously the commuter railroad stations and the, and the parking lots adjacent to them, some of which we own, some of which the, the municipalities own and operate. We're going to be looking for, for opportunities to, uh, to put in significant bike parking everywhere that we can. But we thought the way you know, the MTA has done some important, made some important steps in recent days, in recent months, on bike parking, taking away the requirement that you have a special permit to bring, bring a bike on a, on a train, uh, and so on and so on. We're seeing more and more bikes on the subway. It used to be that we stop people who are doing that. We're not doing that anymore. Um, so we're taking important steps, but we thought it was really important to send the message by starting with Grand Central that we're going to be putting bike parking everywhere we can. Hey, Jenno. Um, so I understand that you have to start somewhere, fully aware of that, but what's the threshold for success here? I mean, you're talking about six spots at the center of a busy island that's very well connected to transit. You've got city bike everywhere. So I'm wondering how you think about how, how well this is going and, and where you look to expand and how you evaluate that. You know, it's, a, it's a fair question. The legislature has asked us to come up with a plan for more for increasing pedestrian bike access so through that i don't have a specific goal right now except that the message is we're looking at every facility even the ones that are most historic and you know frankly most crowded and hemmed in from a real estate standpoint as opportunities for bike parking because we want every mta facility to have those last mile first mile connections and we're doing it and we're going to put out a full plan as part of what the legislature has uh, set in motion, but again, I emphasize the MTA was already doing some significant stuff on bike, you know, facilitating bike use and easing uh, the connections even before that legislative enactment. All right, there we go. Once again. Jana Lieber. Okay, now that we've covered bikes, and we, oh, we covered bikes, which is pretty exciting, but there's other news as well. And Lisa Daglian, stop pretending you're a member of the press. You're, you're, you're part of the, uh, the bureaucracy, right? <laughs> um, we're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to make another announcement today about uh, relevant to MTA leadership. Um, our, our partner, our colleague Phil Eng, uh, let me know yesterday that he is resigning as the president of Long Island Railroad effective in a few weeks. Phil has been a really strong leader at the Long Island Railroad as evidenced by the fact that the Long Island Railroad has completed, the, in, in 2021 they had the highest on-time performance ever in the Long Island Railroads, I think it's 100 plus year history. Um, and just yesterday, they had 100% on time performance in the morning rush, and I think 98.5% on time performance in the evening. So 
it's a really, you know, the railroad is in really solid shape and ready to welcome back many customers uh, as, as the economy comes back and as, as uh, commuting comes back. Um, the MTA, it's no secret, is investing billions in the infrastructure of the Long Island Railroad. Here we are in Grand Central, and 130 feet below us is a brand new, almost finished Long Island Railroad terminal, ready to accept, you know, hundreds of thousands of riders every day. And we needed, as we trend, as Phil uh, uh, retires, we needed somebody who can seamlessly step into and focus on completing the incredible transition into this new Eastside Access era, finishing other critical projects like Third Track, the expansion of the Long Island Railroad by 40% in the first time reverse commuting on the Long Island Railroad. Also, not to be forgotten, the completion of the doubling of the width of that key east-west concourse in the Long Island Railroad level of, of Penn Station. Penn Station's pretty crappy right now uh, because of that construction in part, but in a year we're gonna open a double size concourse in the Long Island Railroad level. And we need somebody who can focus on delivering those critical projects, getting the railroad ready to operate those critical projects, and on getting all of our riders back and getting them back to, to uh, a safe, convenient, service level. Um, we need somebody who knows the commuter railroads. We need somebody who knows the MTA. And we need somebody who knows Grand Central, as I said, where the Long Island Railroad and Metro North are about to be roommates. For all these reasons, I'm naming Kathy Rinaldi to serve, in addition to her role at Metro North, as the interim president of the Long Island Railroad. She's been at Metro North as president since 2018, and her first her first day leading both railroads is going to be February 28th. This is shaping up, as I said, to be perhaps the most eventful year in the Long Island Railroad's history, with the new service at Grand Central and Third Track and the opening of the concourse. Having Kathy to see those projects through is incredible. There's nobody else who's really more prepared to play this role. Um, and I think I've uh, conveyed that. Uh, very clearly. I'm thrilled that she agreed to take on this additional responsibility. Kathy, you can't tell it always from her accent, but she is from Long Island. Uh, she is uh, a, a kid who grew up in Huntington, a little before that in Massapequa. She was previously the Vice President and General Counsel of the Long Island Railroad from 20, 2008 to 2011. She has 20 years of experience, nearly 20 years of experience at the MTA overall, not just as President of Metro North, being the EVP at Metro North, General Counsel of the Railroad, Deputy Executive Director of, and, and General Counsel of the MTA and Chief of Staff of the MTA. Nobody else has that kind of history at the MTA. Um, at Metro North, Kathy uh, led the efforts to improve system reliability, safety, achieve excellent customer service, and continue all the extensive infrastructure work that we are doing to maintain service and safety and the entire system. She has great relations with labor, and I'm thrilled that the Long Island Railroad labor unions, um, their reaction has been extremely positive. Um, they know Kathy, they respect Kathy, and they're ready to work with her. So I want to thank, end by thanking Phil Eng, who took on the railroad a couple of years ago, who brought it to this incredible level of performance that we've seen in the last year, who mu helped the railroad muscle through uh, the COVID pandemic, and who will now turn it over to Kathy, as I will as well. Kathy. Sure, I don't have any prepared remarks. I just want to thank Jano for the confidence that he's been putting in me by, by giving, this, giving me this unbelievable opportunity and this unbelievable challenge. I'm very grateful for it. I'm very grateful to be able to serve in this way and excited for the challenges ahead. So thank you. Hi. Uh, oh, one for each of you, if you don't mind. Um, 
for, for Kathy, I guess I'd just ask you to tell you tell us more about your Long Island roots for, for people who maybe are a little uneasy about a Metro North person running Long sure. Island Railroad. Can you tell us more about your roots in Long Island? And then I'll have a question for Jano also. Sure, absolutely. Like many people who grew up on Long Island, um, I'm actually, uh, I was born in Brooklyn, um, and my parents moved out to Long Island when I was small. Uh, so they moved out to Massapequa first when I was three, and we lived in Massapequa till I was 10. And then we moved to Huntington, um, which is where my parents still are. Uh, and my brother also lives in Huntington. I'm a proud graduate of Walt Whitman High School in Huntington Station. Jano, uh, and, 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 and a summa cum laude graduate of Yale University, I might not. Oh, that place, okay. Uh, uh, Jano, I, I know you're talking about how uh, all the sense it makes, uh, especially with Long Island Railroad yes. coming over here to Grand Central, Metro North going over to, to Penn Station, but is there something to be said for I don't know if conflict of interest is, is the word, but these are different constituencies, rail, uh, Long Island Railroad riders and Metro North riders, and, and sometimes what benefits one doesn't necessarily benefit the other, so th does that create any, any kind of issue? I, you know, I, I think that uh, that may have been the way some people thought of it before, but I don't think that's happening. I think that now what we're, what we're seeing coming into being is a system where you can get from Montauk to Wasaic and you could come in and, and transfer within Grand Central, right? You're, you're seeing the vision of regional connectivity, which benefits Long Islanders and people in, uh, in the Metro North region as well, coming into being. So, uh, I, you know, they're really, we, we, what we have today is a system where we're, we're going to share, you know, some physical space, but the bigger benefit is we're moving towards things which are simplifying ticketing, where people can understand through more coordinated schedules and online information, how to get from A to B to C in a more, uh, you know, more efficient uh, and faster way. So those connections are being built there, but people are living in the region and, and they're gonna benefit from this new connectivity. The final thing I would say is, I think that, uh, you know, folks who live in Brooklyn and the Bronx, are, we don't expect them to be in competition, even though sometimes they ride different lines uh, and, and our investment is in the whole system, in New York subways and buses, and increasingly um, we have a similar regional approach. But nevertheless, the uniqueness of the Long Island Railroad system, it, what I wanted was somebody who understood that. That's why I selected Kathy. Kathy knows the Long Island Railroad physically, she knows it operationally, and equally important as we're moving into this new era where we are accomplishing some meaningful benefits to everybody in terms of connectivity. She knows how to work with the MTA centralized functions, HR, finance, legal, all those functions. You need somebody who knew the MTA as an organization well, and God knows with Kathy's history in all aspects of the MTA, she's uniquely positioned to do that. So I'm really optimistic and I think it's, you know, there's really nobody else who could do this job on a dime like Kathy Rinaldi. Um, two questions. Really? Uh, yeah, really? I know. Uh, two questions. Uh, one about masking. Are you worried about um, people not wearing masks on MTA subways, trains, buses, and then the railroads, uh, even though mm. that goes away in March? And then for Kathy, uh, since you're with Metro North Railroad now, will you take away the extra R on L I double R? Um, that was for the transit. Right, that's a. Uh, uh, yeah. You, the only that we we're the transit buff in the house, right? Um, what was the first question? The key <laughs> mask. Okay, the the mask requirement on mass transit is a federal requirement. So the decision about whether to maintain it or lift it is a decision that we made at the federal level. We're not making that decision. What we have been doing, and we've made, is during Omicron, we have seen um, mask compliance rise, and we continue to you know, see that up 95, 96 percent on the subways, I think comparable number or numbers on the railroads. So obviously we're in an environment where, you know, mass compliance in society at large may change because the rules are changing. But for now, we're, we're going to continue abiding by the federal requirement. 
I think you should keep the two R's on Long Island Railroad. Um, uh, you, so now you, you, Phil's, Phil's leaving, you have to replace Phil. You've been without a permanent New York City Transit president for two years now. You've been without a chief operating officer for a year. What are you doing to fill some of those vacancies in a permanent way? And does the MTA have a problem attracting and retaining talent okay, at those levels? You, you know, you, okay, go back, Clayton. You know, I'm, uh, go back and look at our press releases on appointments in the last month or two. And I'm, you know, I'm going to point you to them because I know you know them. New CFO, the former head of public finance at Goldman Sachs. New CAO, chief administrative officer to run many of these centralized functions. The outgoing uh, uh, DCAS commissioner from the city of New York, Lizette Camillo. A ton of other key appointments. So um, uh, a, new, a new general counsel. So every one of those slots that has come up, we've filled. We've done it with people of the highest quality experience and diversity. So I'm extremely proud of what we've been able to do. And uh, we're going to continue to you know, fill jobs as they become available. But the big picture, and I hope you'll convey it to your readers, is that we have grown the leadership of the MTA in terms of expertise, diversity, and we've filled a ton of jobs with incredibly qualified people. Ask around, uh, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll find confirmation in the public at large. Uh, so you guys had a three million day. I'm the, sorry, I can't. You, you had a three million day on the subway. Uh, looks like another one. You're optimistic is coming, but two three million days in a row. Two three millions, maybe a third. See if we can go for the hat trick. Uh, I'm wondering though, it's you guys were set back by Omicron on the subway and on uh, the commuter rail, and I'm yeah. wondering if you guys are starting to look at revising your revenue projections, going back to the McKinsey numbers, and kind of rethinking those. We've been through two variants now, so I imagine we're a little off track from where you thought you'd be in December 2020. How do you kind of reevaluate that? I mean, I know no one wants another variant, but we're seeing the potential for massive disruption when these things happen. It's a fair, it's a, it's a fair point, as I frequently say, and we will, um, we're, we're, so far, you know, we, we were right on target with the projections uh, from McKinsey before Omicron. Obviously, we've had a little setback, but just think about where we've come from the depths of Omicron. We were at barely two million riders on December 27th, and right now we're over three million. So, and we were at 3.4 just before Omicron. So it, it, between the movement that we've seen the last couple of weeks, which is really a surge, plus what we hope and think will be, um, you know, significant back to office move in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, we're optimistic, but you know the point about re-examining our uh, our projections is a fair one, and we're thinking about how best to do that. I think that's the right way to tell you um, how best to do that in the context of our financial planning. It's not something you can do, you know, in an afternoon. So we're uh, we're, we're 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 bearing down on how best to accomplish that through uh, mechanically and and what input puts to consider as we as we model our our, fu our economic future. Okay. Sorry. The, uh, the, 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 the guy from the Newsday gets his two questions at this event. I, I came all the way from Valley Stream for this. <laughs> uh, it's not so far. <laughs> don't, don't mislead people. It's part of Queens almost. <laughs> uh, simple enough, did, did, did Phil give you any kind of context on, on why he's making this decision? Look, Phil's, well, Phil was very clear. He's like, he said 39 years, and we're going to release his his resignation letter along with our, our the press release we're going to put out a little bit. Um, Phil, you know, Phil is 39 years in state service. He, you know, he came to the MTA after a long and very distinguished career at New York State DOT. Um, I think this was just a personal decision about where he is, you know, uh, in terms of his career. And uh, I know he thought about it a lot, but that was, that was what he told me yesterday. That's what's reflected in his letter. And, um, and you know we wanted to be we wanted to move quickly because we have a lot to accomplish and we knew we had the right person it was pretty obvious very quickly